You are loved with an everlasting love. That's what the Bible says. And underneath are the everlasting arms. This is your friend, Elizabeth Elliott, talking today with my son-in-law, Walt Shepard, and my daughter, Valerie. Welcome, Val. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. And welcome, Walt. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Val, maybe you have a few little things to say about some of the things that your husband told us yesterday. Well, we were in the midst of talking about his high school years and his uh, terrible desire to please his peers or to be like everyone else, not to be different because he had grown up on the mission field and come to the States when he was 14 or 15. I had quite a different experience through high school. Um, Because I came to the States when I was eight years old, it was not such a big adjustment for me to fall into the public school system as it was for Walt to as a teenager. But I remember knowing that I was different in high school and yet not seeming to be bothered too much by it. I do remember wanting to wear the short skirts that were popular in 69, 70, 71 and arguing with you about that, thinking, saying, I'll never wear skirts below my knees, and that's exactly what I have on today. But I don't remember much more than that uh, as far as wanting to be like the crowd. I knew that I wanted to follow Christ, too, and a major commitment, I think, was made for me between my freshman and sophomore year in high school, that knowing that Jesus had to be my own Lord and Master and that I was, I needed to be committed to following Him, When Walt came to the States, he was 15, and you were saying that your parents' affection meant a great deal to you, but the pull of the crowd seemed to mean more. And we were saying, how do we encourage parents today who have children who are more enamored with following the crowd than they are with following Christ? And that is the covenant. We know that we have a covenant-keeping God, We know that we can pray in faith that God will draw our children to himself. I remember so well when we first were starting to raise our children, when we had children maybe four and two and a baby, that you said to me, Val, we we will raise our children in faith that they will not have these rebellious teenage years that everybody expects. We will not raise them in fear that that's going to happen. And I remember that making a big impression on me as we started to raise them and and trusting that God was going to help us to raise them up. How can you say that as you look back on your own teenage years, you see how you want to raise your own children because of the way you went? What, What is it that affects how you talk to your children now as teenagers. We have three teenagers. We have a almost 18-year-old boy and a 15-year-old girl, and Christiana is 13. Well, Val, we, we must say here that the uh, strength to our marriage is that you didn't have that wretched life that I had, and that we saw God faithful in your life uh, without having to run to the far country like I mm-hmm. did. And I mm-hmm. praise God for that because I'm not going to live in this fear, as you said so well. I'm not going to live in the fear that my kids are have to go Dad's way. But I'm not going to spend much time on my past. I'm not going to spend, really, any time trying to uh, let them in on all the on all the sort of stuff. I learned a lesson with my sister when she was going off to a far country, I saw that look in her eyes. I recognized it. And when I tried to talk to her one night, particularly one rather dramatic evening, and I said to her, I said, listen, don't make the mistakes I made. And she said to me in anger, she said, don't preach to me and expect me to learn from your mistakes. Mm-hmm. Whereas my youngest uh, in the family, uh, growing up, the younger brother, I asked him, I said, now what kept you out of going the way your older brother did? What, uh, what kept you from harm? And he looked at me and he said, Walter, I was watching you the whole time, and I did not want to relive that horrible experience for myself. Mm-hmm. So each kid is different, mm-hmm. and yet... Um, the encouragement as we as we raise our children is in that same God, in the same Father who loves our children more than we do. And so we, instead of worrying, we're going to remind him 
and remind ourselves that these are his children they're not ours i think this is the this is the difference between making an idolatry out of our children for a lot of parents this is i think this is what's behind this strange empty nest syndrome that i hear people talking about was there a crisis experience that really turned your life around yes uh, I think I think it's important to to make just that little distinction that it was really is really the God of my parents that I was at issue with not not necessarily uh, the whole Christian uh, family uh, basis from which I was leaving home at one point I became so so desperate in this search for getting my life in my own hands this is this is rather pitiful but i felt like i was losing my grip on my life and i was uh, at a party and going on in the back of my mind were several things one of them was trying to actually take the the steps toward reconciling with a lady that i thought i loved at the time and uh, just realizing my life was a mess and i was out at the lake, Lake Pontchartrain in, in New Orleans at the time, and I just thought, let's let's just get in the car and we'll go see if, if I can be reconciled to this other person. And I was in my car going east on I-10 when I said to myself, what are you doing? You're not going to straighten up. You're not going to change your ways. And uh, if you do get reconciled to this other person, you're going to only drag this other person through your mess. So why don't you just end it now? And that's when I looked up ahead, saw the taillights of what looked like an abandoned vehicle. And uh, I pushed the accelerator as far as it would go and did as much speed as I could to hit this parked car and hoped to end my life. What I didn't know was there were two people that were in the car who had just left the car to change places. Had they been in the car when my car hit, they would have been destroyed. And the car made quite a crash. There were a few people around at that time of day. It was 3.42 a.m. The highway was deserted. There was a manager at the Holiday Inn just across the highway who heard the crash, went out the door, went back, and called for Slidell Memorial Hospital to come send an ambulance. And uh, I was in this mess of a fire, a huge blaze. I had gone through my windshield, landed up in my engine of this little sports car, and was lying there helplessly. I, I couldn't get myself out. And uh, two people appeared mysteriously at that time and pulled me out of the fire. They walked right into the blaze, pulled me out of the fire, and held me there while the ambulance came and placed me inside the ambulance, and then they disappeared. I was protected miraculously at that time, obviously. Who do you think they were? Well, uh, the highway patrolmen were were really puzzled about this. They'd never seen anything like it. And after talking to my father, my father said to me weeks later, he said, son, they had to be angels. They couldn't have been just mere men. They appeared from nowhere and, and went nowhere. Yeah, apparently. they vanished. Uh, the highway patrolmen were trying to conduct the, the interview so that they could uh, create a, a report of the scene. I think you told me that... the. Patrolman said that there wasn't any way that anybody could have gotten anywhere near the blaze, right? The blaze was uh, about uh, 50 feet high in the air, and the area around was so hot nobody could come near the vehicles while they were burning. And these guys just walked in there like it was uh, like it was a picnic. They walked in there, pulled me out, and held me. And all I had to show for it, as far as the fire was concerned, was a little bit of singed hair on my on the top of my head. You were not burned beyond recognition? No, I wasn't burned hardly at all. In fact, all my injuries were lacerations. And the other amazing thing is that when you woke up in the hospital and you realized that you hadn't killed yourself, the nurse said to you, you ought to be thanking God that you're still alive. And you said... Yeah, I said, that that's was... the last thing I want to do. And uh, the doctor convinced me I needed to give him my parents' phone number. I said angrily, hey, I'm not a juvenile. Just get me cleaned up and I'll see my parents. And he said, son, you're not going to see your parents past this morning. 
so you owe it to them to let them see you one more time. I fell unconscious and looked up again and there was my father standing there and I couldn't look him in the eye, I was so ashamed. But it's during the recovery of this that I found myself surrendering to Christ. Talk about a changed life. Walt Shepard is the pastor of the Aliso Creek Presbyterian Church in... Aliso Viejo. Uh, Aliso Viejo. Thank you, Val. And the father of eight children. And I am the very blessed mother-in-law of this man. I was going to say son-in-law Not of Elizabeth mention. Elliot. <laughs> well, thank you ever so much, Val and Walt. Do you have a closing word you'd like to say, Val? Well, of course, I can say thank the Lord that... The Lord saved Walt from from this death, and we are blessed. We feel like our cup is running over, and we know that God had a purpose for him in saving him that, at that point of his life. On your birthday, your 40th birthday, which wasn't very long ago, when I talked to you on the phone, you told me about two happy surprise parties that you'd gotten and some gifts that you got, but you also said... But Mama, I am so blessed. I am so blessed, not just because of the parties and the gifts, not primarily, but because of all God's mercies. So I am blessed in having a daughter and a son-in-law like these two people, and we're going to be talking to them again. Thank you, Walt and Val. Mm-hmm. 